la rosa in Jerusalem that day. The soldiers tried to clear the narrow streets, but the crowd pressed and see the man condemned to die on Calvary. He was bleeding from a beating, there were stripes on his back, and he wore a crown of thorns upon his head, and he bore with every step the scorn of those who cried out for his death. Down the Via Dolorosa, called the way of suffering. Via Dolorosa, triste via in Jerusalem. Los soldados le han preampaso a Jesús. Mas la gente se acercaba para ver a quel lavado a cae la cruz. Por la via Dolorosa, cu es la via del dolor. Cristo Rey Señor E voi e voi e voi sarebbe sul Por ti, por mi Por la vita dolorosa al Calvario When dawn had given way to full day, the Sanhedrin council assembled consisting of religious leaders of the Sadducean party, along with the chief priests and religious scholars. They took him to their headquarters for interrogation. If you are the anointed one whom God promised, tell us plainly. If I give you an answer, and if I ask you a question, you won't answer it. But this I will say to you. From now on, the Son of Man will take his seat at the right hand of the power of God. So you are the Son of God, then? It's as you say. What more evidence do we need? We've heard it with our own ears from his own lips. So the whole council got up and took Jesus to Pilate. They brought accusations against him. 
We have observed this man leading our nation astray. He even forbade us to pay our taxes to Caesar. He claims to be the anointed one and a king himself. Are you the king of the Jews? It's as you say. I find this man guilty of no crime. <clears throat> he has been stirring up disconsent among the people all over Judea. He started up in Galilee, and now he's brought his brand of trouble all the way to Jerusalem. Just a minute, is this man a Galilean? When Pilate learned that Jesus was indeed Galilean, which meant he was officially under Herod's jurisdiction, Pilate sent him over to Herod, who was currently in Jerusalem. Herod was fascinated to meet Jesus, for he had heard about him for a long time. He was hoping he might be treated to a miracle or two. He interrogated Jesus for quite a while, but Jesus remained silent, refusing to answer his questions. Meanwhile, the chief priests and religious scholars had plenty to say, angrily hurling accusations at Jesus. Eventually, Herod and his soldiers began to insult Jesus, mocking and degrading him. They put expensive clothing on him and sent him back to Pilate. This ended a long-standing rift between Herod and Pilate. They became friends from that day forward. Pilate assembled the chief priests and other Jewish authorities. You presented this man to me as a rabble rouser, but I examined him in your presence and found him not guilty of the charges you have leveled against him. Herod also examined him and released him to my custody, so he hasn't done anything to deserve the death penalty. I'll see to it that he is properly whipped and then let him go. It was a custom for Pilate to set one prisoner free during the holiday festivities. Away with, Away this, with man. this man. Free, free Barabbas, Barabbas instead. instead. Barabbas had been imprisoned after being convicted of an insurrection he had led in Jerusalem. He had also committed murder. Pilate argued with them, wishing he could release Jesus, but they wouldn't be silenced. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Why, what has he done that is so evil? I have found him no offense worthy of the capital punishment. As I said, I will punish him and then release him. But they would not relent. They shouted louder and louder that he should be crucified. And eventually, Pilate capitulated. So he pronounced the punishment they demanded. He released the rebel and murderer Barabbas the insurrectionists they had pleaded for in his place. And he handed Jesus over to them to do with as they desired.
friends, as we gather on this Good Friday morning, we have our worship service situated in what are called the Solemn Reproaches this year. The Solemn Reproach Reproaches are a, an ancient text of Western Christendom that are often associated with Good Friday services. Uh, they, they follow a similar pattern to what you would find in, in some of the Psalms that were written by King David. Uh, they, they invite us to consider all of the good works of faithfulness and support uh, that God has provided to God's people and the people's repeated rebellion and refusal to, to be in relationship with God in, in gratitude and in mutuality. So uh, we are going to hear the reproaches and reflect on them today uh, with a number of very short reflections, some video, some musical, uh, some spoken. And we invite you simply to be in this space and to abide in this time as we gather at the foot of the cross. And so you will notice that with each reproach, we will also extinguish a candle as we symbolize the growing darkness of the day of Good Friday. And so let us begin. Oh, my people. Oh, my church. What have I done to you? Or in what have I offended you? Answer me. I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. I led you through the desert 40 years and fed you with manna. I brought you through tribulation and penitence and gave you my body, the bread of heaven, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. In 1788, on Good Friday afternoon, there was a huge fire in New Orleans. And as is tradition at the time, without any other way to warn the people, it was customary to have church bells ring whenever there was a fire or any disaster impacting a large group of the city itself. And so in the innermost core of the city, it was very tightly packed housing where mostly Italian and Irish immigrants lived. And as the fire was raging, they were noticing the bells were not ringing from St. Louis Cathedral. So a group came to the church and banged on the door. And there was no answer. And they banged on the door more and there was no answer. And finally, one of the priests opened the door. And when they told the priest of the situation, and they implored the priest to please ring the bells, to please ring the bells. The, the priest said that they were not, that they were in solemn and deep contemplation on the death of, the, of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and that all other things paled in comparison. You know, when I first heard this story many years ago, I couldn't even imagine how that could be, how someone could make that choice or a group of men would make that choice. But as I came to understand this tradition of Good Friday or our, our, our reflection at this time on Good Friday, I did start to realize or at least understand how they could make this choice. Now again, the question for us today is not necessarily whether you would or wouldn't have rung these bells. I still know where I kind of land on that. 
But again, it's not about whether we would or wouldn't ring the bells, but it's a time today to give deep consideration of why they did not. I invite you to hold yourself in that space during this service, during this day, until Easter morning. chosen Ferris vineyard. I made you the branches of my vine. But when I was thirsty, you gave me vinegar to drink and pierced with a spear the side of your savior. And you have prepared a cross for your savior. I went before you in a pillar of cloud and you have led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I scourged your enemies and brought you to a land of freedom, but you have scourged, mocked, and beaten me. I gave you the water of salvation from the rock, but you have given me gall and left me to thirst, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. This is the moment where hope is lost. 
This is the space where you can't see past what is. This is the time when you are flailing about in the murky mud of life. This is the place where it's impossible to construct any meaning out of this senseless act. Not yet, anyway. It is the numbing, the grieving, the anger that has dominion, but fear most of all. How could this happen? This crucifixion in the heart of history. How could one so lovely, so holy, be silenced so viciously? There must be reason in this senseless. Someone must atone for this deceit. We seek a scapegoat, one to blame, a person, a system, an evil man, an absent God, careless and stupid people. There has to be a reason why the world is so off kilter. It cannot be chaos. The world cannot be capricious. God cannot be indifferent to our suffering. Order. Order. There has to be order. And then he looks at us. We, the sweep of humanity that are from Adam to now. His compassion is just barely distinguishable in those eyes while the pain seeks dominance. What more could I have done for you that I have not done, he says, to us from the cross. It is not I who has caused this pall to settle over the world. For I gave everything for humanity. Abundance in the fields and vineyards, away through the desert places by night and day, lands of plenty where freedom was the elixir and water flowed from stones. There was always enough. And yet, for you, my beautiful, broken humanity, never enough. His reproach is too terrible to bear. It must be deflected. Who can we blame for this cross, this bitter drink, this blood from his side? It was those evil Romans who caused all this pain, or perhaps those unfaithful Jewish people who crucified our Lord. The nail in the soul of humanity was driven by the others, the evil and the unfaithful. They are the ones to blame. They cause all the trouble. They are the wretched ones who have stolen God's creation and ravaged our joy. They must pay. We must bring them to heal. Not me, not you, we are the innocents. We are the pure and holy, we are the absolved. If we were in charge, none of this would have happened. And yet, when we come to ourselves, we know deep down that the time for scapegoats is long past. The time for blaming the other is over. We are all implicated in this crime against God and our world. There is a stain of the evil and the unfaithful in all of us. We have all continued in our pleasures as the world burns. We have all betrayed our siblings of humanity as they have suffered and we stood by. We have all benefited from systems where injustice is not a bug but rather a feature. Precious few among us are the women at the cross. So many more the ones who yell, crucify him, crucify him. Our cry to get him out of the way. His very presence a reminder of our failure. His way a testament too piercing to ever allow entrance. Much too onerous to seek justice and resist evil when we are so afraid. What more could I have done for you that I have not done, he asks. 
You have given me gall and left me to thirst, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. And the tears stream down his face. I gave you a royal scepter and bestowed the keys to the kingdom, but you have given me a crown of thorns. I raised you on high with great power, but you have prepared a cross for your savior. My peace I gave, which the world cannot give, and washed your feet as a sign of my love. But you draw the sword to strike in my name and seek high places in my kingdom. I offered you my body and blood, but you scatter and deny and abandon me, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. On that day, that Friday, he was made to suffer, inflicted by our transgressions, burdened by our iniquities, tortured by our violence, more than what he could endure, hatred made real and palpable, anger and cruelty against the body lashed out on the skin against all that was true and good and beautiful, a mob lynching the innocent against the divine son who just wanted to be one of us, cutting down the tree to carve out a cross grown from a seed, a plant whose life's goal was to reach the sun and provide air to this world, the sustenance of breath, people of power made it into an instrument and tool to execute a political prisoner. Someone who was deemed a traitor because he sought a world better than our own. One where we sit at the table together, where the sick are healed, their wounds mended, and liberation is pronounced to the imprisoned to speak against the principalities of this world 
resisting their strategies of violence, declaring the day of the Lord. But all these dreams were dashed on hardened hearts, hearts not able to see God with us, present, breathing the same air, laughing, crying, sleeping, being with, standing beside, needing us as much as we needed him. Except for the few women who followed him to the end, he was abandoned, left to die, until he breathed his last, until he forgave his offenders, executed with thieves, death row inmates, hanging their heads with him, until the clouds darkened, their chests sunken, until the light of the world was extinguished by merciless hands, making the brilliant sky dark, eclipsing, crucifying God, open God, vulnerable God, tender God, who hung there as dead as that tree.
I sent the spirit of truth to guide you, and you close your hearts to the counselor. I prayed that all may be one in the Father and me, but you continue to quarrel and divide. I call you to go and bring forth fruit, but you cast lots for my clothing, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. I grafted you into the tree of my chosen Israel, and you turned on them with persecution and mass murder. I made you joint heirs with them of my covenants, but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt, and you have prepared a cross for your Savior. As the story of Good Friday continues, we will hear that two others who were criminals were also led away to be put to death with Jesus. And so as in life, so in death, Jesus will spend time with outcasts. Luke marks a distinction between the people and the leaders. Luke tells us that the people stood by watching And I often wonder if they were the women who had come from Galilee or if they were the ones who had praised Jesus for his deeds of power when he entered the city a mere week ago. If they were followers of Jesus, they were brave to even be there because there was nothing that they could do to stop what was happening. But the leaders did not stand by silently. They scoffed at Jesus with words echoing the devil's taunts during the temptation in the wilderness. In fact, in Luke's gospel, the temptation story in Jerusalem ends with Jesus standing on the pinnacle of a temple and saying, if you are the son of God, then throw yourself down from here. And here we are this morning with Jesus again in Jerusalem and being raised up on a deadly pinnacle. And again we hear, let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God. The sign over Jesus' head might as well have just said something to the effect of, look what we have done to Jesus and imagine what we will do to you. The fear and the helplessness and the hopelessness So why doesn't Jesus save himself? Why doesn't Jesus climb down off his cross? One more taunt comes at Jesus, this time from one of the criminals. Are you not the Messiah? Then save yourself and us. While the crowds chanting for his crucifixion have been eager to chide Jesus to save himself, this criminal also wants Jesus not only to save himself, but to save the criminal as well. Why not if he is the Messiah? And then the other criminal confesses his own guilt and declares Jesus innocent and says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The condemned man sees what Jesus' disciples, what the crowds, what the authorities fail to see or understand. Only a repentant criminal is able to recognize that rejection and death are for Jesus the way to royal power at the right hand of God. The taunting of Jesus on the cross feels more like a temptation, a temptation to misunderstand and misuse the nature of God and Jesus' relationship with God. And it is a temptation that is contained in that one sneaky little word, if. If you are the Messiah, raises the hidden possibility that maybe you're not. 
The word if raises questions and doubts about the true nature of God and Jesus' relationship with God and demands an immediate, conclusive answer. It gets us thinking, or rather it gets us doubting. And it shifts us from relating with Jesus to reasoning about Jesus. It shifts us from love to logic. It moves us from our hearts to our heads. If Jesus really is the Son of God, why doesn't he save himself? What does it mean to believe in a Savior who doesn't save himself? In our lives, I imagine all of us have times where we would very much like to have a Savior who would come to the rescue to kill the bad guys or cure the disease or end the injustice or solve every painful circumstance. But that is not the kind of Savior that Jesus is. Jesus will hang on the cross for hours. And we might imagine that Pilate is still uneasy after the morning's trial and he's eager for the Sabbath to come because he knows that in the Sabbath even the people would not cause trouble because it is the Sabbath. We could imagine Pilate looking at his watch and saying, strange. It is so dark at noon and it doesn't look like rain. And in Luke's Luke's gospel, Jesus does not cry out in despair as in Mark and Matthew. His dying words are the psalmist words of deep assurance. Father, into my hands, into your hands I commend my spirit. And then Jesus breathes his last. And as we will hear, it is a Roman soldier, a centurion, who dares to challenge the deadly verdict and says, certainly this man was innocent. And among all the followers and the people who one short week ago were singing Jesus' praises and the authorities and all of the people that Jesus came to reveal the nature of God's love for humanity too, by the end of our story, only a criminal and a centurion will see the truth. When Jesus was born, he was wrapped in bands of cloth and laid in a manger as Mary and Joseph watched over him. Now this morning, another Joseph will come and wrap Jesus in bands of cloth and lay him in a tomb. But Jesus is not sleeping. Jesus is dead. And we pray for him. We commend to Almighty God, our brother Jesus, and we commit his body to its final resting place, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. May the Lord bless him and keep him. May the Lord's face shine on him with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon him with favor and give him peace. Amen. Winter always melts into springtime The darkness always fades into light The very same winds that blow the storm in Will sweep the blackest clouds from the sky And when all is said and done Hope will rise upon the dawn of a new day Just as quickly as it came
came, dark will scatter as the morning breaks. There's never been a hill without a valley. There's never been a day without a night. Our shadows are the proof of the sunshine. Our pain reminds us we're still alive. And when all is said and done, hope will rise upon the dawn of a new day. Just as quickly as it came, dark will scatter as the morning I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters. I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And you have prepared a cross for your savior. Yeah. 
thirsty, looking for mercy, we have all been kicked aside. We are the stumbling of hearts of fumbling. We are the as we are, we are loved, just as we are, taste and see, loved as we are, beautifully different, as we are, just as we are, and when we We are the broken body of Christ. At the end. Just as our readers are coming uh, up. Um, there is an installation, art installation in Hospitality Hall that Dana has been working on so hard this week. So if you would like to, after the service, walk through it, it takes about 10 minutes. And it will be open tomorrow as well for those of you at home who want to drop by from, what's the time, Dana? Noon until 3 tomorrow. On the way to the place of crucifixion, they pulled a man from the crowd. His name was Simon of Cyrene, a person from the countryside who happened to be entering the city at that moment. They put Jesus' cross on Simon's shoulders and he followed behind Jesus. Along with him was a huge crowd of common people, including many women, shrieking and wailing in grief. Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep instead for yourselves and weep for your children. Days are coming when people will say, blessed are the infertile, blessed are the wombs that never bore a child. Blessed are the breasts that never nursed an infant. People will beg the mountains, surround us. They'll plead with the hills, cover us. For if they treat me like this when I'm like green unseasoned wood, what will they do to a nation that's ready to burn like seasoned firewood? Jesus wasn't the only one being crucified that day. There were two others, criminals, who were also being led to their execution. And when they came to the place known as the Skull, they crucified Jesus there in the company of criminals, one to the right of Jesus and the other to his left. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Meanwhile, they're drawing lots to see who would win Jesus' clothing and the crowd of people stood watching. So he was supposed to rescue others, was he? He was supposed to be God's anointed son, the liberating king. Let him start by liberating himself. 
The soldiers joined in the mockery. First, they pretended to offer him a soothing drink, but it was sour wine. Hey, if you're the king of the Jews, why don't you free yourself? Even the inscription they placed over him was intended to mock him. This is the king of the Jews. This is written in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. And one of the criminals joined in the cruel talk. You're supposed to be the anointed one, right? Well, do it. Rescue yourself and us. But the other criminal told him to be quiet. Don't you have any fear of God at all? You're getting the same death sentence he is. We're getting what we deserve since we've committed crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong at all. Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, please remember me. I promise you that this very day you will be with me in paradise. At this point, it was about noon, and a darkness fell over the whole region. The darkness persisted until about three in the afternoon. And at some point during this darkness, the curtain in the temple was torn in two. God, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with these words, he exhaled and breathed no more. The centurion, one of the soldiers who performed the execution, saw all this, and he praised God. No doubt. This man must have been innocent. The crowds of common people who had gathered and watched the whole ordeal through to its conclusion left for their homes, pounding on their own chests in profound grief, and all who knew Jesus personally, including the group of women who had been with him from the beginning in Galilee, stood at a distance, watching all these things unfold. Meanwhile, a man named Joseph had been at work. He was a member of the council, a good and fair man from a Judean town called Arimathea. He had objected to the plans and actions of the council. He was seeking the kingdom of God. He had gone to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. He removed the body from the cross and wrapped it in a shroud made of fine linen. He then laid the body in a cave-like tomb cut from solid rock, a tomb that never had been used before. It was preparation day, the day before the holy Sabbath. And it was about to begin at sundown. The women who had accompanied Jesus from the beginning in Galilee now came, took note of where the tomb was and how his body had been prepared, then left to prepare spices and ointments for his proper burial. They ceased their work on the Sabbath so they could rest as the Hebrew scriptures required. 